All right, well, welcome to uh, public lecture. This is Maths Month as part of the celebrating 50 years of computing at the University of Waikato. So this is a, a math themed math law, but um, definitely features computing as well. Part of what I do here in addition to the, to the following and that physics and all of that. Um, and so this talk, the idea is it's, you know, measurements and models and kind of how those things play off each other and how they complement each other and, and how they are sometimes different. Um, in this, I just wanted to put an extra picture here. So this is actually a tape recorder, which looks somewhat like a cassette tape. It's that style of uh, recording device, which is one of the ones used on the Voyager spacecraft. So Basically, for 45 years, this thing has been sort of recording and playing back, uh, and it still works. Well, I guess they don't make it like they used to. Uh, yeah, so that would have been built sometime in the 70s, which sort of lines up nicely with this idea of 50 years of computing and technology. Um, so I, I don't usually do this with an overview at the start of my talks, but I thought at least give you some sense of where I'm going. It's a little bit of a meandering sort of story. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about models, statistical models, physical models, uh, measurements, what does that actually mean? Um, and then switch to the Voyager spacecraft, right? So this is now out of space, far away from Earth, you're measuring stuff. Um, so, so what does that mean? How does that work? Um, and then the heliosphere, which is sort of this larger structure sitting outside this, well, in a, in a sense, the solar system sits inside the heliosphere. That's sort of the next largest structure, and the voyagers are exploring that area. Um, and then switch a little bit to IBEX, which is another type of spacecraft taking measurements, but in a very different way to voyagers. So I'll, I'll talk about that. Um, and... With IBEX, we're able to deduce the magnetic field that's sort of far away from Earth, basically out where the voyages are and beyond, and in that faraway area of space. So we can deduce that using IBEX, but voyagers actually sitting inside that space also taking measurements, right? So the real question is, are those things the same? Does it all make sense? Um, and so that's sort of one of the key sort of the climax of the talk, as it were. It turns out some bits don't quite work. Um, it, yes. Uh, and then, so we, we tried to, uh, we sort of put this together, we went to publish it, and then because we sort of disagreed with what Voyager was measuring, we said, well, you know, that's what was a 45-year-old mission that's cost a billion dollars. Maybe you're wrong, maybe Voyager's not wrong. You know, that's sort of thing. So there's, a, there's a, just a little bit about the peer review there's a nice resolution of it all at the end. Okay, so what is a mathematical model? Uh, this is just my definition. I guess I could have gone online like everybody does and say, Miriam Webster says. Um, but the way I think of mathematical models are, are a way to fill in the gaps between the things that you know, things that you measured, sort of absolute things. What's in between? Well, you have a model for that's one, one way to use a model. Maybe you have some measurements, but they're sort of a bit noisy. So your model kind of draws a nice line through that. That's a good approximation to, uh, to how things maybe should be if your measurements were perfect. Um, and the main reason to have a model is, is to make predictions, right? You want to sort of, you want to measure a certain amount of stuff and then make some predictions about other related things. I mean, ideally, what you want to do is extrapolate, sort of to go, you know, forward in time, or go to another region of space, or whatever your parameters happen to be. So it, the, the mathematical models can't really exist without the measurements, but they're a sort of a way to extend the functionality of the measurement. Um, so where the forecasting sort of works like this, right? So you have. Uh, so you've got, you know things about how weather works. That's not exactly a data point, but it is a way to, uh, to understand what's happening. You have lots of data from ground stations, so you know about the 
air pressure, you know, humidity, you know, temperature, lots of places, lots of time. Uh, you have data from satellites. They're looking down on the, the clouds, the weather patterns, how things are moving. Um, and so that tells you a lot about what's going on right now. But the, the value of weather forecasting is what you really want to do is take this forward, right? You know what the weather is today, but what will it be tomorrow or next week? So that's that's sort of the uh, extrapolation sense. And to do that, you need models and inevitably a lot of computational power. You need a, an understanding of how airflow works, how precipitation, how all these things are related. So that's not what I do, but in many ways, there's, there's parallels uh, to to that. Um, so I, none of my statistics colleagues are here, so I can say this quite <laughs> uh, I, I tend to think of models, I mean, mo the general model, of course, is a mixture of stuff, but there's sort of a statistical element and then there is sort of physical elements. Yeah. You could isolate those. You could say, well, there's a statistical model is, sorry, this is a bit wordy, but you can either listen to me or read it. Um, so a statistical model, uh, you have a bunch of data and you, you look for patterns in this data. And you, in principle, don't need to know what's causing those patterns. If you can identify them, then they are there and you can follow those patterns. And you can use those patterns to make predictions. Right? So it tends to work really well if you've got loads of data and if, you are, if you're trying to sort of probe the world within that space where you have all this data, right? So this sort of fits in, into into machine learning. These ideas. I hope I'm not saying the wrong thing there, but it feels like, you know, in a very loose sense, that is where it goes, right? So in its really simplest form, that's just a straight line through some data, right? So this is just some example of the internet. Uh, this is to do with some byproducts from a volcanic eruption and. You get a certain amount of this stuff and a certain amount of that stuff, and you you just take some measurements. You take a sample. You say, "Oh, I got this much. This is silicon dioxide. This much of that stuff." And then you took another measurement, and it's a bit more, a bit less. And you don't know for sure whether you should draw a straight line through it, but it seems reasonable, and it's certainly a good estimate. Probably, you'd expect next time you you, you find some stuff that should lie somewhere near that line. So that's a predictor. Even though you don't, this doesn't tell you anything about why those concentrations are like. Uh, yeah, this is it. So one of the downsides of statistical models is that it doesn't necessarily tell you, you know, what's causing what. Right? So this is yeah, but, you know, a joke from XKCD, but uh, basically these guys, you know, this, this idea that uh, since people started using cell phones, cancer rates have gone up. So maybe cell phones are, you know, bad for you. Uh, so this guy looks at this data and he says, well, yep, I can see a rise in cancer cases, then a rise in cell phone usage. So clearly cancer is causing cell phones. Cancer came first, cell phones went up. So you can, you can sometimes, if you try to get too much out of a statistical model, it can actually lead you astray as well. Um, so the, the other sort of extreme is a physical model. Uh, and I should point out this first three lines there is not a physical model. This is actually a statistical model. So Kepler's laws are laws of planetary motion. I should have spelled this out before. Kepler's laws of planetary motion. Um, so this, these are relationships that Kepler obtained by carefully mapping where all, where the, all the planets were, actually Mars mostly. Um, and he deduced that planets follow ellipses and that the sun is at one of the foci of the ellipse. And then there's another law about uh, equal areas, equal times. And there's actually a third law about the orbital period related to some other thing about the size of the orbit. But the, the, the point here is that uh, by careful observation and effectively fitting a line through these points, 
Kepler was able to deduce these fundamental relationships. And so it's a statistical model in that sense. Um, you can achieve the same thing with a physical model, which starts very differently. You start with a, some basic relationship between some fundamental parameters, and you build up the model from there. So you start with something very simple, and you then make it more complicated. You naturally gain uh, some complexity. But by doing that, you kind of know where you came from. So you, you, you kind of know why things are happening because you're connecting this model in a sort of a causal way. So if you know about Newton's laws, right, so F equals MA is sort of one of Newton's laws. Newton also has a law of gravitation that looks something like this. Formulas don't matter. You're all math you're a mathematician, so these formulas are actually easy. It's supposed to be a public lecture where I say, don't worry if you don't know what this means. Um, but just starting with those two things and then doing a whole bunch of calculus, uh, you can actually derive Kepler's law. You can show that just those two initial assumptions lead you to Kepler's laws. So this is kind of a very cool thing where you can actually... Uh, you know, you, you observe some relationships and then you're able to derive equations that uh, give you, lead to the same result. Uh, the big difference is that with a physical model, you can make sort of causal predictions because you know what's causing what. So what happened was we had these laws for planetary motion. People were looking at Uranus and saying, hmm, Uranus is sort of wobbling around a bit more than we would expect. Uh, you know, that's so either gravity is wrong or, you know, maybe there's something in the fundamental assumptions. If that's not the case, there's only really one explanation. It means something else is pushing Uranus around. And if it's a planet, then you can basically calculate where this planet should be. And they're able to do that. And once, once they sort of went through this process and they could tell the um, observatory, okay, tonight look at this place, this location in the sky, and indeed they found Neptune right there. So this is a really uh, powerful thing that physical models allow you to do. Uh, okay, a little bit about COVID modeling. So this is some work with Han Gan, my colleague some things we did last year, but it's a, it's a similar sort of idea. You have a causal model, you have a physical model. Okay, again, don't worry about the details of these equations. It's just to show you that there is maths here, um, and, and these things need to be solved to be able to make predictions. But we also have data, All right? So this, this plot here, this is uh, January, February of last year. These blue dots are the number of daily cases in the y catalog. COVID-19, and the blue new sort of line is, is our model. And we can tweak some of the parameters in the model, particularly this lambda and some of these other things, to make it fit the data as best we can. Once we have that, we say, well, we can just let the model continue, right? Make a forecast. All right, so that's what this is, right? So this, this little bit down here is, is all of that. And then you just let it go forward. So you're able to forecast what will happen. It's not guaranteed, of course, but it's a pretty reasonable estimate. Turns out I checked this the other day. What actually happened was the peak was a lot sooner, early February, and it was similar height, maybe slightly lower. So, and then it went down again. So uh, it wasn't perfect, but you know the hospitals and the DHBs are. I sort of at least happy to have some kind of sense of where things are going. Okay, so that's models. Uh, so what about measurement? Measurements seem easier, right? It seems like, you know, we've got your kitchen scales and note that I download the same. Right, so you've got your kitchen scales. So well, how have you used this clamp? Well, just put it in there. Read out what it says. 100, 100 grams, 150 grams. There's your answer. It's it's absolute. It's a measurement. Uh, it's not quite that simple. If you look inside scales or 
and the same is true of many instruments, uh, you know, that, that number doesn't just pop out of nowhere, right? There's, there's actually stuff going on inside here. So there's normally a spring in one of these sort of scales. And so then you deal with Hooke's law, which is, tells you about how springs work. Um, so there's actually a theory kind of sitting inside your instrument. The other problem is, um, well, yeah, you can, you can reset zero on, right? So suppose I don't have they'll put the, the basket on that I can sort of choose make it point and zero, then I can lose the weight of something else. Not something else. The same thing, but in a different way. Um, and that's that's what's called calibration. So you, you want to make sure that your instrument is, is reading the right thing, that zero is actually zero. Right? If it's, you start off with the, with the scale pointing at 100, you stick something on, you're going to get a number bigger than 100 when it maybe wasn't really, uh, that's not the correct weight. So you need to know where zero is. And actually, there's a second version of this, which is you need to know how far should it move to go up by, let's say, 100 grams. So there are different types of calibration. This, this, Spending extra time on this because calibration will come up as part of Voyager as well. But yeah. Okay. So we know something about models, we know something about measurements. Uh, let's just look at something more, not more interesting, but something different. Uh, so in the 1970s, and if it was planned even earlier, um, NASA launched two spacecraft. Uh, called Voyager 1 and Voyager 2. Can you imagine? I mean, the Voyager part is cool, but they called them 1 and 2. Um, uh, and the, the reason that they were actually sort of in a, in a rush to launch um, in 1977 is that there was a, an alignment of these planets, of Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and, and also Neptune. So by launching at that time, you can basically swing by and see all four of them. So this was... Actually, if you want to tie that back to modeling, clearly somebody's doing modeling to show that this will actually work. So that that was the motivation. It's a, it was a big mission, initially even more costly and extravagant than this, but of course, it can get trimmed down a little bit. So Voyager 1, so actually Voyager 2 was launched first, and it, path should take, it takes it past all four planets, Voyager 1 was launched a little later, and actually the reason they launched it slightly later was that if there was a problem with Voyager 2's launch, they could reorient Voyager 1 to, to then that one could at least see all four. Uh, but once Voyager 2 was on its way to see <coughs> these outer ones, they sent Voyager 1 only to look at Jupiter and Saturn, and then actually exit in a different part of the outer solar system. So, so this is a kind of instrument. It's actually really a whole, just a whole bunch of instruments all just jammed together. You know, we don't, we tend to think of a spacecraft like, you know, the space shuttle with little nice wings and all sorts. It's just a, a metal rack with lots of stuff attached to it. You can see a picture of it here. You can see the size of, you know, humans. It's, it's a big, a big thing. I think it weighs like 500 kilos or something. A big heavy piece of equipment, lots of, as you can sort of see this, one of the original diagrams, lots of uh, instruments, all them, right? Things, different ways of measuring all sorts of different things. Um, currently, the experiments that are running are the, uh, are those five, although Voyager 1's plasma instrument is actually broken, so Voyager 1 is not one of those. Uh, the key one is the magnetic field. Thinking about time, uh, just I'll just quickly say so. How how would you power a spacecraft? So normally, what you would do for almost every other spacecraft is you just put some solar panels on it, get a good view of the sun when you're away from the Earth. So that should be fine. But of course, Voyager is going far away from the sun pretty quickly. The the energy that's hitting you is 
de decreases to becoming significant. And so instead they, you know, this is sort of 70s solution, just throw a lump of plutonium in there and it'll be good. And actually that, that works exceptionally well. If you really think about this, uh, this is, I don't know how big it is, sort of this sort of size, um, being giving several hundred watts continuously for 45 years. So obviously no battery, no, you know, it's, it's, it's so much better than anything else you could imagine. And they, they expect, you know, what happens, of course, is uh, these are this is radioactive, which is good because that's how you can extract some energy from it. But it's also bad because it decays and eventually it'll appear altogether. So over time, it's losing. And so things have to be turned off. And eventually, sometime in about 10 years' time, it won't even be enough power for it to send any signals back. So basically, it'll be gone. Um, so Voyager's passed the planets. That was in the 80s already. Um, this, this is the diagram that the, the, uh, talk about. I'll talk a bit more about what this really means. But um, after passing the planets, so if you... If you think about this picture, the sun is here. There's these little swirly things. That's the orbits of the planets. Then there's this barrier, boundary, whatever you want to call it, called the termination shock. Both voyages crossed this, and it was clear that, that this happened. You can see it in the, um, in the readings on various instruments. Uh, so that's in the, in the 2000s. Then in the 2010s, they crossed the heliopause. And so now both voyages actually are, in a sense, outside this, this thing called the heliosphere. And I'll explain what that is on the next page. But it's this sort of larger structure that, that sits around the solar system. So it's not on the scale of other stars. Other stars would be hundreds of meters away from here. Uh, so it's still quite close by, but bigger than the orbits of the planets. Uh, right, so what is the heliosphere? Um, so here, you know, maybe start on the right-hand side. This is a model from 1961. Uh, obviously, 1961, nobody's solving stuff on supercomputers. Maybe a little bit of a computer to calculate these streamlines, actually. Uh, but... Basically, the heliosphere is formed when you have, it's really the interaction between two flows. You can think of this like a liquid or a fluid or a gas. Technically, it's not quite any of that, but as, a, as an analogy, it works pretty well. So you can think if the sun is here and it's um, basically, there's a constant outflow of ionized gas it doesn't matter if you don't know what that is, but it's solar wind. It's just outflow from the sun, continuous, nonstop, and that fills space. You might say, wait, wasn't space supposed to be empty, right? Yes, it is. Well, it's not. <laughs> yes. Uh, it's very low density. So better vacuum than we have on Earth, but that doesn't mean it's completely empty. And so actually... All of space, interplanetary space, is filled with solar wind. So I get I get asked to review papers on solar and wind energy because my my papers have the word solar wind in it. But I mean, in a very different context. I'm quite adamant. No, no, no. You can review this. Know about solar and wind energy. Um, so this is this number one, I guess. I'm trying to sort of link this. So all of this stuff in here is, you can trace it back, it came from the sun. But once you're past this boundary, which we call the heliopause, you're out in here, and this is also similar sort of partially ionized, very low density gas, sort of like a vacuum, but not really. Um, and that's the interstellar medium, is what we call it. It's really the gas that's floating around in the galaxy. And so the sun is sort of moving slowly through this gas, this picture sort of from left to right. So from the sun's point of view, the interstellar medium is sort of flowing around. And these, these plasmas, or these, these gases, don't really mix, except maybe far downstream. 
right? So in this front path, they, they say ZEP3. So that's the, the heliosphere. Of course, uh, so that was a model from 1961. Here's a recent uh, model. All right threw some equations up just to show again that there's some real maths here. This is not just uh, us uh, playing with a etch a sketch or something. Um, so here's a rendering, a three-dimensional rendering of these flows. So again, you've got the sun in the middle, the solar wind is flowing out, you've got this termination shock, you've got this heliopore surface. Um, and in this picture, we also have this yellow thing, which is due to neutral hydrogen. So in the solar wind, we don't have much neutral hydrogen, but interstellar space, again, it's all low density, but compared to the other stuff, there's quite a bit of neutral hydrogen. And it turns out to play an important role in this model. So yeah, just to connect it back to computing. So we, uh, we run these things on computer clusters to solve these equations. Uh, Fortran 90, I hate to admit it, but this the code from uh, that solves this part uh, from a colleague, and that's actually Fortran 77. So now we really are getting into system years of computing. Um, nevertheless, it you know it works as good as any modern language. It, you know, once you compile it, it it runs it runs great. Um, Right, so what did we do? We did the Voyager, then we did the Heliosphere, then we turned to IBEX. So IBEX is, is another spacecraft, right? A lot simpler, it's about sort of this big. Uh, it orbits the Earth, it's not out there exploring anything, it's just orbiting the Earth. However, it's got these two detectors, uh, IBEX low and IBEX high, very similar, they sort of do very similar things except that IBEX high is sensitive to high energies, IBEX low is sensitive to low energies, and these actually measure neutral hydrogen, right? So I said neutral hydrogen is one of the key ingredients, actually, that's of stuff that's floating through the heliosphere, but it's coming from outside. And on its journey from outside the heliosphere to IBEX, it's been interacting with pieces of the heliosphere. So it sort of has some imprint of um, of those interactions. And so it doesn't directly tell us what's going on out there, but we can infer and with the help of models. So what so what did IBEX see? So IBEX was launched in 2009, which is quite a, quite some time after Voyager. Um, and up on the top right here, this is this is uh, yeah, maybe I should say, um, so IBEX orbits the Earth, spins around, and as the Earth orbits around the Sun, as it's spinning, it's basically mapping out the whole sky. So sort of the, the primary data product from IBEX is the sort of map, but it's a map of the sky. Right? So the sky, of course, in some sense is a, is a sphere, but you can squish it out like you would on a on a map of the world or something. So make it look like that. Um, and, and this really is the first map of IBEX high, first map of IBEX low. And you probably noticed something there, right? There's some big strong feature in this map. And this was unexpected. We expected just sort of some smooth bumps and things. Uh, instead, there's this quite bright band um, it turned out that the, uh, I wasn't at that meeting, but I, I heard that people said, let's not call it a band or a belt. It sounds so masculine. Can't we call it something else? And one of the graduate students said, well, what about ribbon? And no, there's the Ibex ribbon. So that we feel something like more delicate. Um, and of course, the first thing the Ibex guys did when they started seeing this coming up in their map well, something must be wrong. You're seeing this strong intensity just in a small region of the sky. Why would that be? Something must be wrong. Time checking their instrumentation, checking their software. But no, it turns out this is this is actually right. 
or at least there's no nothing yet no reason to believe it's not and in fact the fact that you can see this in ibex low as well ibex low is not as sensitive uh, as ibex high but you can see it and these are in independent instruments so they're both seeing the same thing that's also kind of tells you this is probably right um so you know, so the first question was, so what is this? Um, and even in the first uh, paper from the IBEX mission, which is this McComas 2009, uh, already leading up to the publishing that paper, um, my colleagues and I had done some simulations of the heliosphere uh, with magnetic fields. And what we noticed, or in fact, talking to them, what they noticed was that where in the model the magnetic field sort of drapes over this heliopause structure. Right? So this is looking from the outside in towards the heliosphere. Where it drapes over seems to be where this ribbon is. And so basically they, you know, they didn't want to jump to, to conclusions, but they did want to include this uh, in, in more terms. Right? So this is actually on the cover of science. Uh, and my colleague and I were, were co-authors on that, so that was a cool occlusion. And then, of course, became the question, okay, seems to be some correlation, but what is, what is causing it? So actually, there were probably 15 or something different proposals put forward as to what this ribbon is, what's causing it all sorts of different ideas, but, you know, and that's all good to start thinking, but it's very hard to sort of prove or disprove an idea unless you can somehow quantify this. Um, and so what I did was one of the ones that I liked, seemed to make sense to me, I implemented that into our simulation. So then you suddenly, you can put some quantities into it, right? You can say, well, the simulation says there's this much hydrogen, add a bit of a model, actually turns out almost no sort of free uh, parameters. And you can say, well, if that's true, do we get a ribbon? And in fact, here's, um, so I'm plotting this ribbon in a slightly different way. This is 2014. Um, what was actually observed, so this is the data from Ibex. What was observed actually is that if you look correctly in the sky, it's a circle. It's a see, very circle. So that's uh, this black line is a is a perfect circle. You can see the the ribbon sort of following this around. So this is data, right? So this is, a, I guess, a statistical analysis. Find a pattern. You identify it. You say, well, it's like a circle and so forth. But you don't have a mechanism. But I put a mechanism into our model into the simulation and was able to get very similar looking uh, ribbon. And so once you start to get some, some strong correlation like that, you said, well, I might be onto something. So, so the interesting thing actually is that that in the model, in the simulation, the, the properties of that ribbon that you get are quite sensitive to the interstellar magnetic field. And so what one of my students did was um, analyze uh, different strengths of the magnetic field. That's this, uh, this sort of along the x-axis here. This is Michael Gauss in and of Tesla, 0.1 nanotesla. Um, doesn't really matter. This is a statistical analysis. So what you're actually doing is you're, you're minimizing the error between the model and the data. And so wherever this is low means that these parameters are sort of the best fit. And so we're actually able to deduce if this model of the ribbon is correct, that the likely, we're able to deduce the likely properties, basically the direction and the strength of the interstellar magnetic field. So there's a really, you know, you sort of publish just in this all great and you talk about it, but when you reflect on it, what you, really bizarre, right? You're counting hydrogen atoms at Earth, 
and somehow it's telling you what the magnetic field looks like 100 billion kilometers away. You know, sometimes you have to just stop and appreciate, you know, how cool some of this stuff is. Um, okay, so Ibex, so, so effectively this is what became sort of known as the Ibex magnetic field. In some ways, Ibex didn't measure a magnetic field, but in another sense, without Ibex, we wouldn't know this either. So it's, it's a mixture between the model and the data that allows us to get an estimate of the magnetic field. And so Voyager is measuring magnetic field as well. Um, so how, how does that work? Well, again, it's not as simple as, as we were saying, right? I said initially, measurements are not just, you know, you push a button, you get a number, and it's, it's absolute. There's things happening inside the instrument. So the way the Voyager instrument works, uh, it works on something called counts, um, and there's sort of a, a middle count rate 2048, which would be zero magnetic field. Above that, you would have a positive magnetic field. Below that, it's negative magnetic field. So that doesn't sound too bad, except there's a, there's a big problem. And that is that you've got this big metal spacecraft floating through space, and over time, it's accumulating its own magnetic field. So now, You've got a measurement of the magnetic field, but it's actually what you've measured is a combination of two things, the combination of the spacecraft field and the plasma field, which is really the one you're interested in. But you only have one number, so you don't know how much each one is contributing. Um, here, yeah, this guy. And so you need calibration. It's a very clever trick here, actually. Um, so for the X and Y direction of the magnetic fields, so there's, there's really three directions to a magnetic field because it's a vector. So it's kind of a points in a certain direction. So you have an X component, the Y component, and the Z component. And the Z component is in the direction that Voyager is moving. The X and Y are perpendicular to that. And what they do actually to calibrate the X and Y components is they roll the space every few months. Sounds, sounds really risky. This is a 45 year old thing that's been floating through space. Uh, so many, you know, billions of you know, kilometers. And now you say, oh yeah, just do a few rolls for me. Uh, again, but this is how it works. This is how it's designed. And, and it works really well. So you see here, this was in 2008. So this is the X magnetic field. This is count, right? So they're getting these counts here. They start to roll and the thing sort of wobbles around. What they've really done, if you think about this one, I right? suppose I didn't have this nice and zero. Well, I had some, something extra and I didn't quite know. So here I've got, a, got two things happening. I've got the weight of the clamp plus some other thing in the world. Like we can actually do this kind of trick, right? So if you start to roll this, what we'll see is that particularly at 90 degrees, I'm not putting all the force on this um, scale. So actually what it's reading here should be basically at zero. You could even continue this, kind of get the negative version, see, see what that looks like, we'll see what, what this reads, and halfway in the tone should be zero. Well, it's the same sort of trick. So by rolling the spacecraft, you're able to deduce where the zero is for the X and the Y. You can see that as they do this roll, the Z component not changing at all. And that's because that's the axis of rotation. So that one, you're not able to calibrate. That's a real shame. However, again, before launching this mission, of course, they had to have all these things figured out. So the way you calibrate the Z magnetic field while you're in the solar wind is using a bit of theory. So actually, uh, all your picture was also by Parker. Here's again, Parker viral. Parker 
was there at the birth of the idea of the heliosphere, so he's got lots of stuff named after him. Um, and so these, these circular things, you these spirals, that's actually this magnetic field of the sun that gets sort of spiraled around. Um, anyway, the, the, the long and short of it is that on average, as you're moving out through the solar wind, the Z component, the away component of magnetic field should on average be zero. So what they do is when they do one of those rolls every couple of months, they say, oh, well, how much magne Z magnetic field have we seen over time? And we just set that in such a way that the average is zero. We can adjust it up and down a little. And that's our calibration. And it works quite well in the, in the solar wind. And that's how it was designed. The problem is, um, even past the termination shock, and you can see in this picture, the magnetic field is a bit different. There's actually more turbulence. Not to shorten there. <laughs> the turbulence. Uh, and so, so things are, are actually a bit different there. Doesn't work as well. Um, maybe it's still, you know, still something. Once you pass the heliopause, though, out here, that's not the sun's magnetic field. That's actually the galaxy's magnetic field. So none of this theory works at all. You can't calibrate the Z component of the magnetic field when you're outside the helio. Uh, okay. So, so far, what have we got? We've got Voyager that's measured a magnetic field. We've got Ibex that sort of measured a magnetic field or at least helped uh, determine a magnetic field. Big question is, uh, do they agree? Are they the same outside the heliosphere where, where we have an estimate from IBEX and we have direct measurement? Wait. Uh, so this uh, this is hot off the press, as it were. Uh, this is from uh, some of my colleagues uh, from our paper from this year. In fact, you can see here this was published in March last month. That already gives a clue that actually, yes, it was published. Um, I was going to build up some things. Uh, but you can see here, so this is the X and the Y components of the magnetic field. So the blue, no, sorry, the green line is from the simulation, which really is this Ibex magnetic field, right? So this, this field agrees with the Ibex ribbon. And so the Voyager, of course, you know, there's more stuff. The simulation is always a bit idealized, nice and smooth and nice and everything is nice and smooth. The reality is there's always some bumps and there's always some, some extra things going on. So this is sort of actually a pretty good agreement, right? It's more or less tracking, especially this bit. Tracking very nicely, right? So the black line is the Voyager data for that same component that works pretty well. This is Voyager 1 on the left. Uh, the Y component, same sort of thing where, it, you know, the data's a little under here, but then tracks pretty well, goes over a bit, it starts to come back, you know, looks pretty good. Z component, this is the tech one, uh, maybe not too bad initially, right, because this gray area is effectively their sort of their error. So we're somewhat within the error there, within the margin of error. Uh, but then, then the measurements start to go down and the measurements, basically they're saying there's no magnetic field in the direction that Voyager is moving. It's the, the field is completely perpendicular to that. Right? There's no component parallel to its motion, which sounds odd actually. Right? I mean, if we go back to this, to this picture, this one, this is only just a sketch, but you can see on the white there, Voyager 1 is sort of popping out the heliosphere out here. So it should be in this magnetic field. It should have magnetic field sort of lining up with its motion. And yet they say it's nothing, right? So that means the field is sort of flat there. The, the field lines will be flat. Completely not what the model says, but even just logically, it doesn't seem to make sense. Um, so that's Voyager 1. Voyager 2, you can again look at the X and the Y components. Uh, the model 
uh, heliopause is at a slightly different location than the observed heliopause in the data, so it doesn't line up exactly, but you know, more or less you can, this is fairly believable, so is that. Theta, however, we, we even have the opposite sign. So that, that really strange. However, if you go back closer to the heliopause, uh, the difference, not really that much. The, in fact, the data is strange because what the data is saying is that close to the heliopause, the magnetic field was pointing into the heliosphere, and then after some time, it was pointing away. So somehow the magnetic field split. Was it? Does it really make sense? Um, so when we first submitted this for publication, we said, look, the X and Y components agree really well. This is a really good result. Z component doesn't really, but hey, we wouldn't have expected that because you can't calibrate. However, when we submitted this for publication, so the site inside into the peer review process, the editor, of course, should pass this paper on to an expert uh, in the subject matter. So uh, the, the editor, you know, correctly passed us to some of the people on the Voyager mission. They will know this stuff. Uh, and of course, they take somewhat of an exception to being told that, oh, yeah, well, of course, your measurement is wrong. Um, and so they say, look, this doesn't really work, right? So this referee says, you're saying our data is wrong by more than three sigma, right? It's three standard deviations of, of what they claim is their error. So that, that, doesn't, that doesn't really work. In the case of Voyager 2, we, our model, is saying that their sign is wrong. How can that be wrong? Please. Um, so he actually said, I don't recommend this paper being published. You're claiming stuff that doesn't agree with our measurement. Uh, the editor was good, though. So this is, in some sense, this is a good peer review uh, process book or... I don't know, anecdote. Um, so the editor said, oh, you know, you're, you're sort of ignoring some bits of this data, right, where it doesn't work. You know, I have to agree with the referee. Why Why can you, how can you say that? And uh, this, edit, this editor, I, I know him actually, uh, and he says, look, even, this, this is concerning philosophically, even though I myself am a theoretician as well. I, I sympathize, but you've got to do better than that. So he sort of said, look, if you can convince me, if you can put in a strong rebuttal, if you can really explain why this is wrong, then uh, it makes a lot of sense. So that, that actually became uh, certainly one week, maybe two weeks of my life over the summer to really look at how are they doing this? How are they doing this calibration? Because before you go and publish something and say they're wrong, you better be sure that that you know what they've done, right? And that was hard because there was actually no published uh, documentation. They they had some stuff online, poorly written. It was some of the stuff was clearly wrong, you know. So anyway, I had to sort of untangle a lot of this stuff. Um, but the long and short of it is, what they try to do, they try to they know that BZ the the Z direction of the magnetic field is they can't calibrate on its own. So maybe they can use the X and Y components to sort of get a hint of what's going on. That's the idea. Um, and, and the X and Y are good, right? You can do that role. You can get a pretty good uh, calibration for that. So their idea was this. They, they said, well, suppose you sort of have this, this area of space and you have some plasma, this ionized gas is floating through here. There'll be some little bumps and wiggles and things. There'll be some areas maybe where it's a bit more compressed and then a little bit where it may be a bit more spread out and sort of squished around a bit. And if the squishing occurs in a way that it's the same from all direction, right, so that the squishing in X, the squishing in Y, and the squishing in Z are all the same, then we can look at the level of squishing we see in X and Y and just extend that to Z. It's the only thing you can do. It's the only, only, yeah. So that's what they did. The problem is that might work if you had a completely isolated system. But the point is 
this area of space is close to the heliopause, and there's all sorts of disturbances hitting the heliopause and passing through. So there's these sort of shock waves. And a shock wave is not a nice circular thing that's coming in and out isotropically, as we would say uh, in maths. It has a very strong direction to it. So I, this whole assumption really shouldn't apply it. And so we were able to argue that. And the editor was you know, happy enough for that, that at least we were clear what we did, what we felt. Um, and, and so the paper was published. I don't. Uh, so in summary, uh, so this is just sort of re going back, you know, wrapping everything up. So models complement measurements allow for forecasting, right? That's that's the sort of interplay between mathematical models, be it any kind of model, a measurement, and what you do with it. Generally, you want to be able to forecast. Uh, of course, you shouldn't get too vested in your model, right? In the end, there is a reality check, which is your measurement. Most of the time, it's not the model that proves the measurement wrong. It's the other way around. And um, this, you know, that happens a lot. So you should be ready when, and in some ways, in some ways you know, our model of the heliosphere, uh, in some sense, was proved wrong by the fact that there's a ribbon there in this Ibex star. So that tells you, okay, there's something missing in your model go back and rethink so you can reproduce that. Uh, the less measurements you have, the more you can rely on a model. And it's, I see here I say you sort of you must rely. It's also give you some leeway. So, you know, in, in terms of weather forecasts, you've got lots and lots of data and your model is very tightly constrained. If you're modeling, you know, the interaction of two black holes, you've got a lot of freedom because nobody quite knows what's going on. So, um, yeah, less measurements, sometimes better for modelers, but not much with it. Uh, all measurements require an instrument, right? some kind of way that you get a number out of nature. And there's a lot of things that can go wrong there, right? The instruments really only work in a certain range of parameters, all instruments have errors. They need some calibration, right? You need to kind of understand what you're measuring. Uh, and sometimes it's just some assumption. Case of the voyage. So, summary stayed with, uh, made immense technical pro progress over the last 50 years of computing, right? Tying it nicely back to 50 years of computing. Uh, because that's allowed these computer simulations. It has allowed us to, you know, write out this complicated model and yet implement it, get a three-dimensional picture of things with, with high accuracy and high resolution. Um, and so models, in some sense, you know, the world is getting to the point where we almost treat a model as similar status as a measurement. So if you, if you, you know, if you think about uh, in the old days, a wind tunnel was sort of the ground truth for figuring out aerodynamics for cars or airplanes. Or um, but now you can run a simulation of that, and it's going to be almost as good. So that that's sort of okay. That's me. Question. Bye. Sean, did you did you know this? That, that they did this sort of compressive. They are assuming it's isotropic as well. Yes. Yeah. 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 Clearly not. What? What's going on out? So, using your your model, can, you can back out a an offset for the magnetic field calibration. In the Z direction. All right. So you, you're saying if you, if you actually go on, if if you sort of assume that these green lines are right, what does it tell you? Yeah, that would be. Don't know. It's 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 also an accumulation of error. I think is what they've got. So they 
sort of said, okay, we, we think we've got it right now and we make a small change. Fine, right? And then a month later say, oh, yep, obviously currently we're, well, in the past we were right, but we need to make a change. And so I don't know if it's, a, if it's actually an accumulation of errors. It does seem that way, for example, here, right? Where initially they had, you know, the negative sign was consistent with the model, but now they've got a positive sign. So that seems really strange. So sort of a more basic question, sure. given that you said that the, the measurement in some sense proves that the model is correct or can be used. Yes. Yeah, you know, I'll, you know, I'll, if, yeah. you, if you could say, all right, this is the instrument we need to create and this is what we need to measure to prove that actually our green line is right and the other thing is wrong, what would that take? What would you actually need to be measuring to capture that? And, uh, in, in principle... The same instrument can measure the green line. The problem is we don't know. Like it, it is, it's still like a set of scales, but it, but basically what's happened is with, with this thing of moving around, and we don't know how. If we had a way to know how that was moving, then we could, you know, be sure that we're measuring the right thing. And I would think that we would be much closer to the green. Line. You know, I always have to be careful because, in the end. It, it, it's a model, and model can also be correct. It, it is absolutely possible that the Voyager measurements are correct. That can happen. I think it's less likely than the other way around. But and of course, the problem here is that this is this took to get for Voyager to get there took about forty years. Uh, now you can launch something a bit faster, but not much. You can't. Well, with some very new technologies that we're talking about, you might be able to cut that down to maybe 10 years. But that's technology that actually has not been used. So it's, it's, it's uh, just pipe tree, really. So if they were going to do it, I was sort of following up on Judith's question. Um, so one of the, you got these three antennas for your, like you're talking about, like, to have, like mm. one in the direction of the spacecraft's going. If you didn't mount them like that, so you still mount them at right angles to each other, but one, none of them pointing in the direction of motion, you'd be all right. I think so. Yeah, I'm not sure why they did it this way. Um, I guess in the solar wind, radial direction is something special, and that really is on average zero, so it makes sense to do that. Because in the end, this was a mission to look at the planet. That was the goal, and... Fingers crossed we get to see the planets. You know, now we're talking, you know, 20, 30 years later, and, and now we'll say, oh, why did you do this? You know, it's it's sort of, um, yeah. It's in state of mission. It is, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so you can certainly forgive them for, you know, not having this much foresight. Yeah. Yeah, but you're right. In principle, if if those those three angles were a little bit different, and then you did your roll, you would actually get one of those traces in all three. Yes. Out of curiosity, is there any way to, now that you know two possible ending uh, values, is there any way to use that knowledge that you have to take some other measurement of some other thing perhaps more easily reached from Earth? And then that will give you a hint as to which one of those two is right, since you don't need a specific one. Yes. So what you're sort of saying is that we've got we've got ibex, we've got some magnetic field from that, we've got Voyager, we've got some magnetic field from that. If we had a third one and it agreed with one of those two, that would lend a lot more credence to that. Like if you know something equals either negative one or positive one, you don't have to prove it's exact. You just have to prove is it positive one. Then is there some since you already know the specific values? Is there some secondary method you can do yeah. which doesn't give a specific value but hints which one's right? Uh, I think short answers no, but but yeah, people are always looking for these. these sorts of things. In some ways, that's that's ibex, right? Ibex is not actually measuring that, right? So ibex was sort of the second way to to get a magnet. Indirect. Indirect. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Without going all the way out there and trying to make 
thought maybe there is another indirect way. That would be well. Actually, you know, there are some other things. So people look at cosmic rays. So cosmic rays. Um, this picture's all right. So these are high energy things that come from other parts of the galaxy, stream through super high speed, but they are affected by magnetic fields. All charged particles do some curvature around magnetic fields. The faster you go, the bigger that curve, all of that. Um, but you can observe cosmic rays at Earth, and they have through that magnetic field. So uh, you can. So so actually, it, it is actually true that that most of the cosmic ray uh, observations do agree with this sort of configuration, uh, roughly the field pointing in that direction. They can't pin it down so well, but uh, it is consistent with that. Whereas what we're just seeing with Voyager is that it's saying the field is this way and then that way, right. which is not what that is not consistent. So maybe yeah, they, they have, so there are other hints that the ibex direction of the field is more correct. Otherwise, you can always ask me another time.